Hello, I'm Lux. And I'm Ember. And this is our thoughts on Ruby. Volume 5, chapters 9 and 10. And another one of our predictions bites the dust. <laughs> yes, no, okay, portal and run. She didn't even use the portal to get to where Crow was. Well, she didn't know for sure that Crow was in the same vicinity as Lionheart. But yeah, so one hit last time, miss this time. Two misses. We also predicted that Blake would give herself up. But we'll get into that when we get there. <laughs> I really like how they're going with this. The story's flowing very well. The beats are hitting nicely. I don't think she actually wants to kill Crow. She just knows if Crow's nearby, it will cause problems. And that's exactly what she wants. I think she wants as much chaos as possible to happen, so it's going to be easy for her and the Maiden to snatch the relic and run. Because her plan was made very clear. Because Raven said, okay, if we're going to have any chance of getting Salem to leave us alone, we need this relic. Which seems a little counterintuitive, because if Salem wants the relic, and she chased you down because you had a Maiden which can get you a relic. She's going to be after you even worse if you have a relic. But apparently the relics are more powerful than the maidens because they're counting on having the relic to defend them instead of the power of a maiden. And I wonder how powerful Raven's maiden actually is. I know she's like, I trained her well, but was that all just show? Or is there actually power behind this girl? It's going to be interesting. Well, I'm sure some of that was show, but also look at how strong Raven is. The implication of training isn't just skill, but morals. If basically the queen of the bandits has had the training of the spring maiden, morals are kind of out the window. And there's definitely something important about that mask. Maybe it's actually a good defense against maidens. Interesting theory. Because she specifically asked for her mask and wore it when she was encountering them, and only took it off when she knew she needed to show her face to make the deal. Which could also just be a tactic, so that her expression wasn't giving anything away. But the mask has to have some sort of power, because otherwise I can't imagine why Crow was so reluctant to touch it. Just something about it. Also, if you hear a cat in the background, that's Kitty. She seems to want attention right now. <laughs> well, we are up a little bit past our bedtime. Okay, let's see. What else happened in this episode other than Raven definitely plotting something? Well, we had Raven plotting, and we had all of the stuff on Menagerie, and then we had some dialogue with the Crow, Oscar, and Ruby mm -hmm. group. And that was about everything that happened, but that was a lot. Yeah, and something I picked up on, well, two things I picked up on. One, a theme running throughout this season is, I'm doing it for them. I'm doing it for myself. I'm doing it for this cause. A lot of that going on, specifically in this season, that's really being hammered home that I'm doing it for this. Yes, everyone's saying I'm doing this because it's right. It's right for me, it's right for the tribe, it's right for the world. Which is really good motivation because outside of the stereotypical villains who are evil for the sake of being evil, most villains don't see themselves as villains. They have reasons for what they're doing, and they see it as right and proper action. I can't wait to find out what Salem's motivation is. Salem's motivation is going to be incredibly interesting because she's been at this game for a long time. And maybe her motivation has changed over time as well. It probably has. But I really want to know more because the creators say that the similarities between her design and the maiden design from the fairy tale is coincidental. So do they mean that or were they tricking us? They're very good at little twists. 
they haven't done any big ones yet, but they've done small twists leading us one way and then going, yeah, nope. And then you reanalyze it and go, yeah, yeah, they were pointing that way the entire time. Uh, and the other thing I noticed was Ruby. <laughs> Man, what's really interesting is she didn't ask any questions about herself in this. She only asked questions about, okay, was the relic taken? No. Is that the relic? No. Okay. I'm like, Ruby, you're also missing an interesting fact of what do you have to do with all of this? You're a silver-eyed maiden. <laughs> Not a maiden as in the four maidens, but you're someone with silver eyes. That's another important piece from ancient history. What do you have to do in this big old thing? And why does Ozpin find you so interesting other than, you know, ask him questions about you? <laughs> I think she might be afraid to know, and also I don't think she thinks of herself as that important. Most heroes of that caliber don't. Exactly. So why would she ask questions about herself? She's Ruby Rose. She knows that she's Ruby Rose. What's there to ask? Also, I like the nice exposition little dump there, where it answered the questions people have probably been asking and speculating on for a little bit, like, what's important about that cane? Was the relic and beacon taken? Also, I'm pretty sure we got the truthful answer about the relic not being taken from Beacon and that it's hidden there somewhere. And that it's better hidden than it was at the other academies. But I don't think we got a straight answer about the cane. I think we got a partial answer about the cane. Well, the cane is not a relic, and I'll believe him on that one. That's the part I believe. It, he said that it was special to him. And also that it had a few tricks we hadn't seen yet. So does the cane hold some of this so-called magic? Hmm. That's probably why Crow had it. Hmm. I wonder if the cane and the mask have a connection. Interesting. Or if the cane and the mask are a similar type of item. Hmm. Also, something that I haven't brought up yet is the fact that the mask is grim in design. I don't mean the horror grim. I'm talking about the creature grim. As if you look, it also has some similarities to some of the white fang masks because that was also their theme was, you know, people called them monsters. So they're like, OK, we'll be monsters. But I have a feeling the fact that it's shaped and colored like a grim is very important. It may actually be a mask from a grim. But Grimm disintegrate once they're killed. Yes, that's the difference. Something about this particular Grimm or object of a Grimm didn't. And that's maybe why Crow is like, Ooh. should we move on to the second episode? Or is there more you want to go over about this first one? <laughs> or about the intro? Yes, we finally gave in and tried to look up the lyrics. I don't know how canon or accurate the ones I did finally find are, as the Ruby fan Wikipedia page actually didn't have the lyrics. They had a shot-for-shot -shot breakdown of the intro, but no lyrics yet. Hmm. I remember there was a specific site I went to for lyrics at one point, because I was looking up lyrics to some of the songs you don't hear in this series but are available on the soundtracks. When I was trying to break down some interesting stuff I heard before, I was like, wait a minute, that sounds like this. I must research. <laughs> yes, so if those lyrics were accurate, I definitely misheard the part about it only being possible for the dead. So basically all hope is lost in that portion um, where they're focusing on Osbin right before they switch over to the messing with gods line. That's actually one of my favorite lines there because of the transition between Ozpin and the Doctor. Hmm. Now that I think about it, Doctors messing with God. Yeah, uh, it's showing the Doctor, but it's also showing Lionheart. And Lionheart has switched his loyalties. He was loyal to Oz, and now he's working for Salem. So, who are the gods? Hmm. Ooh. All good points. Mm. Mm -hmm. Even though Oz is being punished by the gods, you can still be punished by one of your own. You're doomed to walk among the mortals. Kind of like that. Yeah. Until you fix this crazy thing you did. You did what now? It's nowhere near as bad as Zeus did. I mean, he effed everything. Demigods everywhere. <laughs> uh, 
But back to this story about gods. <laughs> I really like where they're taking Blake's character. And I pretty much predicted that that one particular character was going to flip sides. We just didn't know when or how far the situation would have to go. And zeroing in on the animation this particular episode a little bit, a lot of the fight scenes felt a bit stiff for me. The characters felt kind of stilted in some of their actions. But then we got into a section where the father was fighting against the two priests, basically. And then the animation got a whole lot better. It was a whole lot smoother. It was a whole lot neater. And there was a couple of like classic anime moments, like the classic, I'm punching your fist with my fist. No, I'm punching your fist with my fist. Yeah, that was basically like, oh, ow, that just, that hurts just to look at. It was like bro hoof to the extreme. <laughs> I love you more, man. No, I love you. So yeah, and I love how we both went <laughs> when the thing fell on the bad guy. Yeah, because I was like, okay, Blake got her father out. Oh, wow, we literally just threw someone under the bus. Yes, I know it's not a bus. It was a balcony. Yes. Starts with a B. And I was basically, I knew she was going to switch, but I didn't know she was going to switch. So the entire time I was like, who is she going to backstab? Who is she going to backstab? She's going to backstab someone. I just know it. And it might be quite literal. And it was pretty literal, but it was more of, I electrify you with my whip. <laughs> I love, you stabbed me in the... <laughs> you stabbed me. Pinch. We're even now. I don't think you know how this works, but okay. So I, I'm actually kind of okay with that because the whole forgiveness thing and, you know, she did prove herself during the apex of the fight because she was both standing idly in indecision and ultimately made moves that helped the Belladonna side. And this... Give me a second here, I had an idea. I hate it when I lose ideas. I wonder if it's underneath this rug. Ah, <laughs> uh, no pulling up the carpet. <laughs> uh, let's see. Well, I've lost it. It's going to do with that fight scene and stuff I was kind of figuring out, and then I lost it. Oh well. Also, interesting that while we know most Faunas have good night vision, apparently Elias is better than Blake's. And I think... Blake couldn't see her because of her camouflage. As the fact that she blended in so well with the background, she didn't have an outline that Blake could probably see under normal circumstances. No, because all we could see were her eyes. I love how Blake was like, sorry, Dad. Starts a fire. Ah, that's what it was. It was specifically about the forgiveness. I remember it now. It's kind of like my own philosophy. It's like, I know it sounds kind of crass, but... Forgiveness is not for the person you're forgiving. It's for yourself. It does benefit the person you're forgiving, but it's more for yourself than it is for the person you're forgiving. Because if you hold on to that, you're hurting yourself more than you're hurting that person you can't forgive. So that's my philosophy. And that seems to be very similar to Blake, who's just like, yeah, she proved herself. I'm going to forgive her. And just moved on. And it was an excellent way to show the villagers that she's also good leader material. Because this was an excellent example of, okay, knock it off with the moral superiority. We are not better than humans. We are just as capable of violence. Here in our island, where you all thought we were safe, we had faunus versus faunus violence. So do you believe me now that humans and us can live together in harmony? I know I just kind of used our own violence to show that we can live in harmony, but... Shows a point that we are in equal ground. So as long as we figure that out and believe in that and show humans that we are on equal ground peacefully, we can work things out. Because I know there's three girls out there who are awesome. And they found out who and what I was. And they went, cool. It didn't matter anyways. And one of them hated Faunus. Mainly because of all the violence that was perpetrated against people she knew. Because we were using violence. Blake's story was less about harmony. It was more of, we're just as capable of violence. We don't have moral superiority here. This was Faunus versus Faunus. 
this wasn't violence brought to our island by humans. This was violence brought upon ourselves by ourselves. And this is what your current leader, Adam, is taking to the rest of the world to show them that we are exactly what they believe we are. But you know that's not true. So let's go and show them that we're not like that, that not all of us are like that. And that just like humans, we deserve to be evaluated as individuals, not as a species. I think we summarized that pretty well. Mm -hmm. I also love it. You commented on it at the time, the force of the impact as Blake's mother stopped Blake's father. <laughs> yeah, because I was like, that was a loud thud. I know he's not hollow. Well, now I know exactly why that guy with the wings is unconscious, because I bet you there's a giant dent in that pan. I'm sure there is, because we didn't get to see much of her fight at all after, you know, the gun ran out of bullets, but it obviously went well. I mean, her hair wasn't even messed up. She's a tough woman. I told you between the two of them, she is the more dangerous. Oh yeah, just the... <laughs> okay. <laughs> if she can stop a guy who tossed men like that around the room with just a simple slap, you know she's strong. <laughs> mm -hmm. She could probably bench press her husband and not break a sweat. Oh yeah. Also, this episode seemed to confirm that Blake's timeline is off kilter from the rest of the gang because Blake's father said that they had two weeks until the attack. And everyone else is saying two days. Mm -hmm. So unless the information the Faunus has is incorrect, which I doubt, Blake's timeline is nearly two weeks behind everyone else's timeline. And I think it's actually been that way for a while since last season actually because a lot of the timelines were actually off sync last season as well like it was obvious that wise's timeline was off of rubies and yangs it didn't flow as smoothly last season the transitions between the different storylines i think that's why some people kind of were like i don't get it nothing happened last season a lot happened last season you just had to see it through the correct lens I almost wanted to re-edit the episodes for some of these other people and go, okay, this is what actually happened. Why didn't they do that? Well, they wanted to show it to you like this. Like, have you ever watched series that show things out of order? Have you ever watched The Melancholy of Suzumi Haruhi? That's a great show that you have to watch out of order. For it to make proper sense. And yes, you could do that re-editing in your infinite spare time. Oh yes, infinite spare time. <laughs> Which I have even less of nowadays, but moving on. You know, it's infinite. And I have less of it. Yes. So, yeah, really interested where things are going from here because what we see in the intro with Ilea standing in front of that portrait, is she now sending out false information? Is she playing as a double agent? Is that even possible? How many active White Fang members are still on the island who weren't part of the attack? Hmm. Also, the grudge that is going to be held for the baddie who died. Can't quite say he was killed, because Balcony fell on him. And yeah, he was kind of thrown that direction, but... Well, he threw himself that direction. So, not murder, but he's still dead, and someone's still going to seek revenge. Yeah, because anyone can put blame on anyone else for anything, pretty much. It's raining, someone must have caused this. Yes, um, if you really want an excellent example of that, go look up the story of everybody, somebody, nobody, and anybody sometime. Hmm. It's a very short story, like two minutes. And yeah, these episodes are fascinating, and they're doing a great job at build-up right now. Because I think there may only be 13 episodes, 14 episodes this season. So we're at episode 10, so... Let's see, 11 and 12, 13 and 14, so yeah, four more episodes maybe? And if that's where it's falling right now, I think we're going to end it with the attack on the Academy. Hmm, yeah, that's probably a good point, and that's 
probably when they're all going to get together again. Probably completely by accident, and I can't wait for the Yang and Blank reunion, especially since I have a feeling it's going to be with Adam in the whole mixer, because I want to see what happens when Yang punches Adam in the face. Other than Adam going through a wall, because that one's kind of a given, but I want everything around that. Yeah, I, I want Yang to just crush that mask right off his face with the new robotic arm. Ah, so outro. Uh, one last thing on the intro that we were discussing. Yang's the only one in the intro who isn't shown picking up her weapon. The other three girls are shown picking up their weapons, but Yang's shown on her motorcycle. And yes, I know her weapon is, you know, the gauntlets and the arm guards. It's not quite as obvious as picking up a scythe, a rapier, a blade with a whip. But still, it's a difference because everyone else is shown picking up a weapon. And she's just shown on the motorcycle. Hmm. I think most of her story has been about traveling. So that may have been what they were going for in the intro. Could be. So now outro? Now outro. And this has been Our Thoughts on Ruby, Volume 5, Chapters 9 and 10. Oh, you're still here. So, uh, what else did you want? A cookie or something? There's a video on Ibra's reading room about cookies. Go watch it. You love it. <laughs> uh, yes, yes. We have no virtual cookies to give you. And we don't know where you are, so we can't send you physical cookies. But if you'd like some more art, you can find Lux's drawings on Tumblr, Twitter, Mastodon servers, DeviantArt, Reddit, a couple other places. You like his art, but you don't see the image you want? He takes commissions. I know, it's kind of odd. You pay an artist money, and then they draw the picture you want. Check the link for pricing and availability. Oh, he... Wow, that, that looks like money. You want to give us that? Well, this is the internet, so I can't physically take it from you. So punching the screen right now isn't really working. It's hilarious and everything, but... So, um, yeah, see those links down there? The ones that say Patreon and Coffee. Uh, those are the digital medium through which we can accept the money that you're trying to throw at the screen right now. So Patreon starts at a dollar. You know the drill. It's a monthly thing. And coffee works in increments of three. No long-term commitments. We understand, you know, you might not be ready for that kind of relationship right now. We get it. Thanks again for listening.